by 2018 uh, Committee of the Whole meeting for the Council. Would you kindly rise for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. <laughs> Counselors, uh, let me remind you, because of our sound system, would you kindly keep the microphone close to you and I'm um, told below your mouth? Somehow that works better. All right, uh, three is a presentation. We have Solmort bronze designation. Mr. Keller. Sure, yeah. Well, um, tonight I'm happy to present to the borough council this, this plaque, which officially recognizes the borough as uh, their achievements and their commitment to energy efficiency as a solar safe uh, or solar friendly community. So council should be commended for their effort to pursue this designation. And I want to thank um, that staff for going through and um, recommending policy changes and ordinance changes to make us a more uh, solar friendly uh, community that will apply to projects across the borough. So some of the changes that we, that we made to receive this designation were the creation of an online permitting checklist which increases transparency for community members um, and solar installers. We reviewed local zoning codes and identified removal of uh, restrictions that intentionally or unintentionally prohibit um, solar or PV development. And we've allowed solar by right uh, as an accessory use in all zones. So solar installations do not require um, special uh, permits or, or hearings uh, outside your, your regular uh, electrical permits. And our staff has been cross-trained, um, both the inspection staff and the permitting staff on um, solar and, and PV uh, applications. So, you know, I think this designation is more than, than just an award, but it's a signal to the community and developers that we're open to solar business. So, I'd uh, like to present this to Calvin. Subcommittee reports, infrastructure, Vice President Cole. Uh, <clears throat> we had our meeting on the 16th. Um, uh, licensing inspector, inspection is, we talked about the shortness of people and uh, uh, property transfers are up and <coughs> looking into zoning officer in-house and building permits are up. Uh, parks and rec, um, EPI, the EPA was at Pollock Park about the hazardous removal and they're complying a report. Uh, they're tracking reasonable remediation. Uh, <coughs> Cedarville is uh, doing Memorial Park bids on some things that are being done down there. And the camp, summer camp is finished uh, a couple weeks ago and the registration was good and it worked out real well. Um, Closed loop systems going slow. There's things they had to get that they're waiting for. They had some issues, and they were working on South Hanover Street, the ADA ramps. Um, they redid Hanover Hanover to High Street, or Hanover Street High to Farmington. Uh, the bike paths were approved from PennDOT. Um, they're redoing the intersections with the railroad, agreements with Norfolk Southern. And uh, we talked about some other things that were going on in town and about, uh, about the arches and things like that, and that's about it. Okay, thank you. Economic development, <coughs> Ms. Lee Clark. Good evening, councilors, Madam Mayor. Uh, short report tonight, uh, Fed on Blanc. Please, if you haven't reserved your space, do so. We have over 50 RSVPs so far. So next Friday evening, right here in Smith Family Plaza, 6 to 9, 
Um, you can order your food from area eateries. If you go on Padita's website, there is a link that shows you what eateries are participating. You just order your food, you pay, and then they will be delivered to the plaza in a nice box with a label. So it's really going to be a lovely event. We look forward to seeing everybody in their white. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about was we got some nice coverage in the 422 Business Advisor. I wrote an article along with, um, there were articles from Hobart's Run and also uh, Padita, and it was a focus on the I Pick Pottstown campaign and all of the great things that are going on here. So our region is getting um, to read about us in a positive light. And the last thing I'd like to just remind everybody that PAID's website is an active working um, entity and there are constantly updates on what properties are available for lease and for sale. And I encourage all of you, if you hear people that are looking for space or would like to know more about setting up their business here, to contact PAID and also to uh, take a precursory look on the pet website. Good. That's my report. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, transportation. Again, Vice President Culp. Uh, we just had our meeting tonight, so I don't know if we're ready to give out a report yet. What do you think, Justin? <coughs> uh, we can wait until next month until yeah. we have a yeah. it's done. Yeah. Okay. okay. Animal <coughs> Committee, Councilor Kirkland. Um, no report at this time. Okay. And while I have you, the Ad Hoc Financial Sustainability Committee. Uh, Justin's going to. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll cover that um, under the, uh, the EIP uh, resolution. Report. Yeah. Okay. Emergency Services Report. Any? None. Human Relations? Counselors, um, the Commission's September meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September the 11th, um, in Council Chambers at 6 p.m. Uh, the Commission is waiting to receive the signed Memo of Understanding from the uh, Pennsylvania the State Human Relations Commission. Upon receipt of the signed MOU, uh, the Commission will move forward with the relationship with our Commission and the State Human Relations Commission. And the Commission is working with the State Human Relations Commission to provide some public training workshops to be held by um, uh, the end of 2018. Um, September 15th through October 15th is National Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and just a reminder, CCLU is providing the Latin Festival at Riverfront Park on Saturday, September the 22nd, starting at 12 noon. And everyone is welcome to the festival to enjoy the events um, that are going to be planned that day. Thank you. Very good. Uh, um, do you have any flyers for the Latin Festival at all? Um, no, I don't. I don't, and I did not see any. I saw a little card, but I didn't see. I had seen something. I, I believe that we have some flyers that are hanging up down downstairs. Oh, are there? Um, okay. okay. By the by L and I. Yeah, on the bulletin board. Okay. Uh, it seems I jumped over ad hoc zoning. Okay, Councilor yeah. Cross. Well, that's it. No. That's why I that's why I hesitated. Human relations. Okay. Land bank report. Um, the, the the chairperson isn't here, and uh, there was uh, no meeting this month, so no. there's nothing to report. Okay. Library. <coughs> Anyone here? All of it, Boys and Girls Club, Councilor Kirk. Uh, summer programs are winding down, and I will have a fall report next month. Okay. Pottstown School District. Anyone? Councilor Lindsay, uh, did a little bird tell me you'd be interested in representing us at the, the school? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have to set up a meeting with 
Oh, with Stephen. Yes. Yeah, so um, Councillor Lindsay and I had an introductory meeting with Stephen Rodriguez mm -hmm. and um, talked about ways that we could um, get a better understanding of the school district, mm -hmm. and Trinita has kind of expressed an, an, an interest in, in, um, in, in doing that. So um, we, we are going to be um, setting up a tour soon, I yes, believe. Yes, that's in October. In October. I see when, when he's free. Yeah, and so, so if I don't any, run it by Jenny. Yeah, so once we have the date, if any other counselors, if you haven't been in the in the buildings for a while and you'd like to take a tour, it, you're more than welcome to, to come with us, I think. Yep. Is that yes, correct? Yep. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. So you agree Thank to be our liaison? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mayor's report. All right. So we had the fourth annual Unity in the Community event, which was sponsored by a joint effort of a lot of the ministries in the borough and surrounding areas. I wanted to thank Peggy, Whit Peggy Whit Whitaker, wife of the late, great Dick Whitaker, for opening up her home uh, to Rotary and hosting uh, our annual clam bank. I did some canvassing for some of our good candidates in town. Um, I also had the pleasure, uh, I think I aged 10 years, of watching the Penn State game on Saturday. So. Uh, and this coming month, we have lots of events. Saturday the 8th at 9 p.m., the Pottstown Pal uh, Football and Cheer Program is having its opening day starting at 9 a.m. Um, Acclimo's having their health fair um, same day, Saturday the 8th, from 12 to 3 at 515 Walnut Street. Um, as Previously discussed, the Latin festivals on the 22nd. Also on the 22nd at 8 p.m., Steel River is having a play, um, putting on a play called Code Red. It's a series of one-act plays written about real-life uh, school shootings. And then there will be a discussion about gun safety. And all the proceeds uh, from that event will go to Every Town for Gun Safety, a nonprofit organization um, put together to help stop violence in schools. We have 50 job openings in the borough in a warehouse. Applications can be picked up at the police department, thanks to Chief for allowing um, one of the job recruiters to place them there. They will be available starting Monday. So there's 50 jobs available. They are full-time positions from 7 a.m. to 3.30. It's entry-level work. No experience is necessary. All you need to do is pass a drug test and be literate. And of course, <laughs> be able to work 7 to 3.30. So applications will be available at the police department starting on Monday. And I think that's all I have. Very good. Manager's report. All right, we um, continue to remain active on the on the grant front. We've submitted several grants to purchase new part buses to replace our, our aging uh, fleet that we have. So um, we hope to get some better um, economy um, out of that. Um, we've also uh, we're, uh, submitted our annual part operating grant as well. And um, later on in the agenda, I'll be talking about a, a local share account grant that we're submitting for the stormwater arches. For those that might be interested, Montgomery County Conservation District will be holding a spotted lantern fly information session at 6.30 p.m. September 20th here in the council meeting room. They will be providing information, background, um, as well as control strategies followed by a question and an answer session. So anyone that's interested is invited to register on the Conservation District's website and um, Coincidentally enough, when I was walking in here today, I looked down at the floor and I, I found this little guy um, <laughs> sitting on my seat. So uh, if anyone hasn't seen a spotted lantern fly, um, come up here, take a look at it, and <coughs> get familiar with what we're dealing with. Okay. <laughs> and finally, just a reminder that September 11th is uh, Patriot's Day. So the borough will be flying the flag at, at half staff um, in remembrance of the first responders and service personnel that risk their lives on an everyday basis to guarantee our, our freedom and liberties. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we now have a presentation. Greg Trainer, Philadelphia Community Corp. One second. I'm so sorry. I forgot the pet fair. And Tracy, I'm sorry. <coughs> it's on my calendar. Can you just fill us in on the details for the pet fair this month? It's September 7th and 15th between 9 and 3 at the uh, Memorial Park. September 7th? No, 15th. 15th. September 15th at 9, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. At Riverfront? Uh, no, Memorial. 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 Thank you. Mr. Trainer. presentation here to go through. It's pretty brief. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we are the Philadelphia Community Corps, so it's a little bit Philadelphia focused. Um, but I think well, I think it'll be applicable here as well. Can everyone hear me all right or should I? Please miss? use the microphone. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, I was kind of curious whether who here had heard of deconstruction as an industry? Right, fairly new thing, okay. So in Philadelphia, this is a little bit more focused on uh, industrial uh, blight and decay. We have a huge abandoned housing problem in Philadelphia uh, that this is largely a part of, but this is applicable to any town anywhere. Uh, it could be, there's a lot of this that is now beginning, we're beginning to see these deconstruction projects happening at the Jersey Shore uh, or in towns where they regularly are renovating their house, you know, redoing their kitchens and bathrooms, or it could be a town that it's a, a formerly industrial town that is now uh, in need of new industry and new job creation. So this really isn't limited to any one place. This could just as easily be about the Pottstown Community Corps. So the Philadelphia Community Corps was conceptualized in 2009 as a means to address blight, uh, but it was launched in 2014 as a job training program. We would now consider ourselves to be a workforce development program. Similar to, but we are by no means the first to do this. This is similar to initiatives that have been succeeding across the country uh, for decades now. Great examples of this would be Baltimore, which has a thriving deconstruction industry with four large organizations operating like us there. And uh, the Northwest, West Co and uh, West Coast in general, which is usually a little bit ahead of us on the environmental issues. They are pa passing all sorts of policies to encourage the growth of this industry. We like to think of it, obviously we're a bit biased here, but we like to think of it as the future of sustainable building rem removal and that in Philly, at least, we are behind the curve on this, but we are excited to play catch up. We have an opportunity here in this. So part of this is reimagining what the problem that we have with blight. In Philadelphia, we've got 40 to 60,000 abandoned or blighted homes, and it's so much that, you know, if this happened overnight, this would be considered a massive disaster, and we would receive billions of federal aid. But in a lot of industrial cities across the country, this happened so gradually that people got used to it and kind of said, well, this is just the way that it is now. And we'd like to reimagine it as one, a more pressing issue, but also an opportunity. In these abandoned houses, we like to see that there is a mountain of bricks and a forest of lumber. These are resources that are waiting to be harvested in older buildings. And it's not just the ones that are blighted or falling apart. It could be any house that's going to be demolished to make room for a bigger house. And that's generally actually where most of our projects come from. And I can speak, uh, you know, I don't have the statistics from Potsdam, but I can speak for Philadelphia. We're spending $20 million a year just maintaining abandoned houses in their current state. And that's the costs that are going to uh, pest control, driving squatters out of these houses, securing these houses again and again, dealing with the drug addiction that generally uh, gathers around these houses. These houses tend to become centers uh, for all sorts of problems to attract these things. So with these resources in them, they're an, an untapped resource, and not just for the materials themselves, but for the opportunity that the demand creates and that these are entry-level jobs that can be created in every deconstruction project. 
as well as once these materials are harvested, where do they go? They are becoming a local resource. So when we are removing materials from a local project, what we see them happening is they're re-entering the local economy. All the dollars that are being spent are staying local and then go on to create secondary markets, like who is now going to make something. Could be furniture, could be a, you know, a conference room table out of the floor joists from that building that we just deconstructed. So there's three major parts to this program that we have here with the Philadelphia Community Corps. The deconstruction itself, the job training, and the actual material salvage. But the idea is that this can become a hub or an engine for economic growth and revitalization. That it's not, it's very holistic. There's what's happening on the work site, but then there's also what's happening back in the warehouse where we process those materials. And then what happens with the customers who take those materials and what they go and create with them. So what is deconstruction? Essentially, you could consider it unbuilding. It is the an, uh, an environmentally friendly alternative to demolition. It's very similar to hand demolition, but it's a systematic removal of building materials in the reverse of the order that they were put together. Essentially, we're reverse engineering the building. And that's where the idea that came from, that this would make a great job training program. Because what do you do? When you don't understand something, you take it apart to learn how it works. So we are putting people out on the work site, and they are taking these buildings apart. And while they're taking the buildings apart, they're learning about what these uh, building components are called, what the tools they're using are called, how to be safe on a work site, how to be reliable and show up on time and communicate on a work site. That's all part of the program that comes with taking these buildings apart piece by piece. As we're doing this, our objective is to salvage as much of the, uh, the building as possible for reuse and then recycling, we refer to that as highest best use. Our priority is that is reusable, and then if we can't reuse it, then you recycle it. And what ends up happening is a very small percentage of that building actually is ending up in the landfill after those two processes. There have been studies done that have shown that this process, incorporating more hand deconstruction, can create as many as seven times seven times as many jobs as straight demolition coming in with the excavator and ripping that, you know, biting that building apart piece by piece, we can see seven times as many jobs being created when we involve do this through deconstruction. So we're reimagining demolition. And we're not competitive with the demolition, demolition industry. And this is why I said we would now refer to ourselves as workforce development. We have jobs that come to us where people say, I want you to deconstruct this building. And I will explain the financial motivation of that in a minute and we refer those jobs to local demolition contractors that we partner with. So the same demolition contractor is getting the job, but part of that is that they are going to do it the way that we would show them how to do it. We operate essentially as a consultant or a nonprofit contractor, and then our job trainees go to work with them like an internship on site with that demolition contractor. It's a win-win-win for everybody. The demolition contractor is saving on their hauling and tipping costs, they get a little bit of free labor from those job trainees. The job trainees get the job opportunity. And the nonprofit is getting those building materials at the end of the day. And as well as the thing that motivates most of it, the developer, the property owners are getting huge tax deductions. And that's what's really driving the growth of this for us as nonprofits. Uh, and we want to continue to work with demolition contractors because this is how we transform the industry into a more sustainable industry without uh, disrupting it too much. So it's a triple bottom line process. Those cost savings are a really big part of it for what happens with the demolition contractor. The developer is getting the tax deduction. We are also preserving our architectural history. I mean, Potsdam is an older city with a lot of history behind it, and it's a shame when these buildings are being demolished to make way for something new. I understand the new buildings must be built. I'm not uh, going to say we have to save every single old building, but if a building must be demolished, why not preserve those materials and keep them around so they can be reused and have a second life again in the, in the local area? And it's also environmental in that we are conserving these, conserving these materials. So our workforce development, we like to consider this more than just job training, it's career development. We're very focused on the holistic side of this. Uh, we do teach them how to take buildings apart. We have a 10-day deconstruction class, and then we do two days of safety training and OSHA training. I'm an OSHA instructor, so all of our job trainings get certified as OSHA 10. Uh, but the real training is the soft skill development that happens on the work site. To earn our certification, they do 900 hours of on-the-job training over six months. 
and that is the time in which we are working with them on showing, you know, usually young people, most of our job trainings have been returning from incarceration or dropped out of high school, but this could just as easily be done with veterans or homeless groups or any other group that people usually target for job training programs. Uh, and we're working with them all the time to focus on, you know, showing up on time, communicating, being a reliable person, everything that the construction industry is looking for in new hires. And I, you, I'm sure you're probably aware of the trades are really lacking for reliable, uh, fresh recruits at this point. There is a, a skill, a lack of skilled tradespeople in this country, unfortunately, at this time. So it's a really important thing wherever you are in the country for people to be getting trained and brought into these industries again. But job placement is our ultimate goal. They spend some time working with the demolition contractors on site, and if they do a good job, why wouldn't the demolition contractor hire them? It's essentially they get to like try them out and work with them and get to know them. For example, uh, this guy on the right here, Lennard, was somebody who had dropped out of high school, and he uh, we put him through a supervisor level training, and he ended up working with a contractor that was turning a old abandoned high school in Philadelphia into apartments and was doing uh, very well there the last time I checked. The girl behind him, Aaliyah, is now, last I checked, was at Daddy Stevens studying architecture. Uh, there was another picture here that didn't load, but it was Aaron who is now a supervisor working on another project. We have former job trainees who are returning from incarceration who are now starting up their own companies who we put through this program four or five years ago. Uh, this is another benefit is what happens to the <coughs> materials when we deconstruct these buildings, when we salvage what's reusable in them. Uh, Wendy here was one of the neighbors of a seven house deconstruction project and row homes when they're built are generally follow the same pattern, again use the same materials. Her house had been robbed of all of the metal exterior features by scrappers who li literally ripped the metal off the exterior of her house. So we were able to give her back window grates, uh, storm door, uh, porch railings that had been taken away from her home that matched the actual period and style and construction of the original house. So we're maintaining the architectural heritage from buildings that were impossible to save are now going to save other buildings. The mural that you see in the top right was from the old West Philly High School, which was being turned into apartments as I mentioned. We saved that and we gifted it to the new West Philly High School that was building so they had that as a memento of their older, older school. You know, we are trying to maintain the character and culture of the, the towns and cities that we work in as much as possible and to keep it all local as much as possible. But on a bigger scale, this really is a very large and important problem for us as a country as well. Construction demolition debris is the single largest component of our national waste stream. It makes up 40% of our national waste stream. And we have seen that up to 90% of that 40% is divertible for reuse. That is a huge component that we are just spending to throw out and get rid of these materials or cover them up, however it may be done, uh, where it could be, like I said, being returned into our local economy. It also preserves virgin resources, forests, that, and mining that does not need to be done across the country when we are using materials that were harvested locally and keeps those those jobs around here and reduces the reliance on heavy machinery which can be disrupted in certain locations you know if you're in a small historical neighborhood you don't want an excavator rolling down your street every day uh, this statistic is very old we have now diverted far more than that from landfills uh, through our projects the picture on the right is a great example of some of the reuse opportunities there was somebody local who was creating greenhouses out of windows that were salvaged from old houses and they're really beautiful to look at they have a lot of character they make a great story a lot of the things that are being made from reclaimed building materials people love that they have a story to them to be able to say well these this these wood beams that I made this table of were recovered from that historic house that unfortunately collapsed well so we are giving the people who become those craftspeople the opportunity to do so but before those people can create those jobs locally, create those secondary markets, making furniture, greenhouses, whatever it may be, there has to be a reliable, affordable supply of reclaimed materials. This can also help for things like lead certification or sustainable certification of new buildings when you reuse materials, especially when you source local materials for that. 
couple other examples here. This is some artistic project that was done by a local student painting uh, some mosaic style pictures on windows, salvaged from a project, a old butcher scale from one of our projects, a bar that we were dismantling, wood paneling that was just some regular, it was actually someone's back porch. Now it's the wood paneling, the decorative wood paneling that you see in all the coffee houses and bars. It's very popular now. Um, and these old beams here, that old growth lumber is something that we're never going to see uh, in many parts of this country ever again because those trees were hundreds of years old when they were cut down and we just don't have them anymore. The modern lumber that we get at Home Depot and Lowe's comes from tree farms and it's just not the same quality. So we do not want this very high quality material to end up in a landfill and just be wasted. So these are, uh, and we do want to emphasize as well that these are entry level jobs that get created. It's, it's really important that it can employ a large number of people and be a great entry point for people who maybe were previously uh, lacking job skills, relevant construction job skills, or maybe had been removed from the workforce for some time. Well, taking things apart is a great way to get them back in and make them feel empowered to get to work again. Uh, but as I mentioned, I do want to throw, uh, mention, get to the financial aspect of this. When building owners, developers, it could be uh, any, any couple who owns their home or it could be a big developer, hires us for these projects, everything in their building becomes tax deductible as a donation because we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Developers and homeowners are seeing huge tax deductions for donating building materials that they used to pay to throw away. Even things that are not traditionally reusable, like plaster, for example, can become tax deductible in circumstances because of the job training that's taking place on site because we can't perform our job training program without your donation of that work site as our, as our training facility. Essentially, your building, your building that's being demolished or deconstructed becomes our classroom. So people in Philadelphia and especially places like Baltimore that have been doing this for a long time are getting very large tax deductions. And that's what's driving the spread of this is that we've made it cost effective to do the right thing. Just, you know, that's kind of our motto is that we're not trying to tell people they should spend more money to do all of this. We are actually saving people a lot of money. They're, sometimes they save so much money it covers the cost of their demolition entirely. Uh, what used to be a dead expense is now a benefit. But it depends on your per personal financial situation as well as, as I mentioned, reduced disposal costs for developers. And it creates these opportunities for reimagined neighborhoods. We are looking at neighborhoods in Philadelphia where abandoned houses were removed and the materials from those abandoned houses were used to create new park spaces. It is, uh, it's very inspiring and it turns a neighborhood that looked like it was in decline into a neighborhood that looks like it's turning around and is inspirational to people. Uh, these, the materials cannot be used for structural purposes generally because of building codes, but there's so many non-structural purposes, especially neighborhood beautification uh, like community gardens and uh, park benches and stuff like that that we really are getting to see a lot of. So it's we generally say that we salvage the materials and we let people come up with their own uses for them. And we now have so many uh, makers and craftspeople who come in regularly to our warehouse store. We have an architectural salvage store. It's 12,000 square feet in Philadelphia. We're looking now at expanding to a 70,000 square foot facility. Uh, and we cannot... Uh, clear the shelves <coughs> fast enough. So we keep lowering the prices, creating more affordable building material supply because the donations are rolling in. The more we do this, the more contractors are beginning to do it themselves without us even being involved in this. Uh, and they are coming up with uses for materials that we never even thought of. We're just the ones who are basically the drop-off center accepting the stuff, creating the opportunity for people to get creative and create their own companies, making whatever it is. Lamps, lamps out of skateboards, tables out of golf clubs, like we've seen it all at this point. It's really exciting and interesting to see and it uh, creates some really dynamic spaces. A lot of <coughs> restaurants, for example, come into our store. But it's, it's growing and we would like to spread it and we, are, we have been reaching out to a variety of other areas, primarily formerly industrial cities are where we see the greatest benefits to be found is areas where industries may have uh, left or shrunken or, sh or shrank and we would like to see this as a way to 
bring back some industry while saving our architectural heritage, while conserving our natural environment, and while empowering uh, whether it's younger or older people to become capable in the trades again. Uh, my contact information is on the screen, uh, so I'm available. Uh, that's my cell phone number and my email, uh, as well as the company email on our website there. If you would like to uh, look for more information, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. That's where we sell a lot of our building materials, actually, is through social media. Um, but you, you know, we're available. If there's anybody with any any questions, we would, ha you know, we're happy to share what we have learned through this process. We're now four years in, and it's, you know, past the point now where it's become financially sustainable. So we would like to see and become part of the growth of the overall industry of this country because we just think it's an incredible opportunity. Great. Um, I have a question. Um, a lot of these homes. Um, abandoned homes, do you have to go through the government to get the deeds for them, or how does that work? There's way, different ways it happens in different places. Like in Baltimore, for example, I mentioned there was four large deconstruction nonprofits. So one of those nonprofits, the biggest one, Second Chance, they're like us in that they mostly are working with private developers and homeowners, and that we don't have the resources right now to go out and like get the properties ourselves. So we're just getting coming into the process, almost like a demolition contractor, to work with the demolition contractor. So we're just sort of like an added phase or layer. So you don't have to deal with any of the, uh, as far as getting deeds for old homes there. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times <coughs> people still own them, but they can't con you know, get a hold of them or you know, there's back taxes. And I guess the contractors that are gonna, that originally want the land are the ones that have to deal with all that. Generally, yeah, the, the people who are purchasing land or planning to build something there have already dealt with that by the time we come into the picture. We do have hopes in the future to get into like a, wi a wider scope of neighborhood revitalization type work that would involve us getting properties that are blighted and redeveloping the, uh, them ourselves, uh, but we're just not there yet at this point. We've really launched this as the most bootstrapped, lean version of this, or of this program that we could possibly make with us essentially operating as like a consultant or partner to the demolition contractors. But we hope to get into that, or we're just not doing it yet. What about uh, properties that might be termite infested or things like that? Or do you have somebody that goes out there beforehand and inspects before you do de uh, demolition, take it down? Well, so, so some of that's part of our training, like for example, asbestos and environmental hazards. We do the OSHA 10 training and also as part of our deconstruction training, one of our days of class is entirely about environmental hazards, teaching our trainees how to recognize asbestos in a building or to know where they might encounter lead or to know, you know when they got to have their respirator on. But we provide all the PPE to handle that stuff safely, but certain hazards like asbestos, we don't deal with that. If we encounter asbestos in the building, it's supposed to have been dealt with before we get there. If we encounter it in the building still, which does happen, you open up a wall and there's a pipe that was missed. We step out of that project for a moment and call the contractor back and say, you gotta get the asbestos guys back here. It's just such a complex world for us to get into at this time that we just don't touch that stuff. As far as termites, we sort and separate as we're deciding what's reusable. That's happening on site. So it's like the building, we worked on um, a country house and barn project last summer in, uh, in um, Glassboro, New Jersey and they were taking it down and there's termite damage all over the place. So we're separating out what can be reused there and we're not bringing the termite ridden stuff back with the rest of our lumber stock because we wouldn't want that to get into our warehouse. So that just happens as on site and there's certain things that we don't deal with but we train our workers to be prepared to recognize it and be aware of the hazards there because that's uh, really, really important for their safety. There are, uh, I should add to your first question, Another deconstruction nonprofit in Baltimore is being contracted by the city as a city contractor, doing like 100 houses a year, and that is another way that this is being done. There's a variety of ways that this is being done. Well, ours is just one model. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <coughs> yeah, my house was built in 1890, and I, I say there, like, even the, just something as simple as like a, a board noise. You know, I made a table out of it, and it looks like a guitar top, basically, because of the little growth spruce. Right, that like the tight grain of, of old growth lumber. I mean, it's really incredible. I mean, it can be 
no matter how beat up it may look, people are always really surprised because we have like a big lumber pile that's like dirty and has nails in it and stuff like that. People are so surprised when they see the finished product coming out. Yeah. The other side is finished. Clean it out. It's, it's, when it looks fantastic, because you'll screw yeah. up your blades with the nails in it, but uh, yeah, because it'd be very expensive and I guess something like that today. You do have to be careful about the denailing. We do a whole lot of denailing, uh, but the end product is really, really beautiful. And we have a lot of customers like yourselves, like you, you're essentially a, a large category of our customers of people who own older homes that are trying to restore older homes. And there's not a lot of places where they can still find those materials. So they come in saying, these are the doorknobs that I have. And one of my kids busted one of my beveled glass doorknobs. And I need one that matches all the others in my, in my house now to maintain the historical accuracy. Well, there's not many places, except for warehouses like ours, where you can come and get that stuff. Would you consider a satellite office at this end of Montgomery County? I already asked. We would absolutely, <laughs> we would absolutely be interested in that kind of thing. I mean, our goal, our hope for a long time, long term, has been to spread this to other areas, and uh, there's there'd be so many benefits to having other satellite offices including you know ways that we could support each other you know mm -hmm. we have a lot of tile at this time we would be able to send tile over to one location or bring this kind of material over to that location or we also get projects sometimes that are just too far away for us to do and we would have to put people up in motels and stuff mm -hmm. like that that's really hard for us to do we have done it but it would be much more uh, it'd be much more preferable to be able to refer that job to another location and say hey this is this is your neighborhood. Well, we, we have space for you. And uh, for your information, we're sitting at the crossroads of Routes 100 and 422. You can reach three counties uh, filled with a lot of old buildings. That would, well, that would be you know, ideal for us, is to be able to access that many places that we can't really reach right now. Right. So, uh, and, uh, you know, really, uh, one of the things that Stephanie and I talked about was that the, one, the real thing that you need is just a warehouse to start collecting, to start accepting those building materials as donations, and somebody who is a little bit of a combination of a contractor and a teacher mm -hmm. to run the thing in the first place. And that those, I think, from there, we can provide as much uh, help and advice and mentorship as possible to help uh, a, a newer organization avoid a lot of the p mistakes that we made when we were starting out. Because you know we really developed a lot of this by trial and error. Uh, but we're happy to, to share that and, like I said, see it grow. All right. If you're sincere in expansion, we can introduce you to Peggy Lee Clark. Uh, she's our director of Pottstown Area Industrial Development, show you spaces available and help you get contacts. That would be great. Wonderful. I'd be very excited about that. Greg, I just want to say thanks for coming all the way out here. Yeah. I really appreciate it. That was a really cool presentation. So thank you. We, we have a question from one of our reporters, Mr. Uh, Brandt. Well, actually, it's a question for council <coughs> uh, regarding what uh, Mrs. Culp was saying. If there's concerns about getting the property deed and all that sort of stuff, is that not something in which this organization could partner with the land bank, which is already trying to get properties? They can provide the legal expertise and whatnot to get the title of the property, and then they can reduce the redevelopment cost by bringing this organization in to deconstruct a home in town and suddenly it's a tax break instead of the cost that the land bank has to undertake. Sounds like a possibility. We have actually explored that possibility in Philadelphia as well, although I would say in Philadelphia it's very uh, political, the process is behind the land bank, you know, it's uh, there's all sorts of parties trying to decide how exactly the land bank in Philadelphia is going to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we uh, we're trying to work with them, uh, and they're kind of in a holding pattern at the moment. But we had basically hoped for something like that. You know, once uh, one of the big pieces is educating and more people about the potential of the tax deductions, because so many of the buildings that are falling into the decline and disrepair, people look at them and they're just like, it just looks like a demolition expense. Now I got to pay. 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 to knock that down before I can get started building what I want. Whereas if you get that appraised for donation value, you may be looking at that and saying, well, that's actually a, that's a $100,000 tax deduction right there just for that 2,000 square foot home that is falling apart just because of all the materials that can be itemized from that. 
So if you are looking at your properties in the land bank, that is another way for you to attract development or pro property owners who to be interested in those properties because now that becomes more of a benefit to them if they could use that tax deduction. Well, this land bank is brand spanking new and hasn't had the opportunity to get political yet. Well, that's great. They don't have a single property, so maybe <laughs> they don't have more. Stay small and simple. That's why. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I have a question. Sorry. <laughs> this might be kind of silly. Do Do you ever go into like old trailer parks and and tear apart those? And I know a lot of that material isn't the best in there, but you have the uh, the metal and the aluminums and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. It's just a, a thought. We, I mean, we scrap on our projects too. I mean, scrapping is recycling, and recycling is good. You know, our pr preference is reuse. And I can tell you, actually, one of our most popular items, anything having to do with a barn, is very popular for us in our store. So barn siding, you know, all the coffee houses want to have it up on the walls now, all of that. But one of the things like uh, corrugated steel, stuff like that, is also very popular net right now as a decorative or accent type material. Uh, or is roofing, you know, people are building sheds and greenhouses and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of community gardens in Philadelphia, and they love uh, any sort of metal sheeting material like that for those uses. So we would do that. We just haven't been contracted for that. I can tell you, when we come into a project, we do a $5,000 flat fee to provide our deconstruction consulting to bring the job trainees out and to itemize and manage all the materials on the back end of our warehouse. Uh, that, you know, whether or not that's worth it for most developers who bring us into the project is dependent on the value, the size of the tax deduction. So the bigger the property, the more items in the property, the bigger the tax deduction, you know, so you, a fact, for example, a, a bigger house, bigger tax deduction, right. big factory, big school, big, you know, big old industrial site, huge tax deductions, uh, for smaller things, uh, for smaller, um, trailer parks like that, it would it might not be quite as much of a financial incentive, but it's certainly possible to do and we'd be happy to do it. It just depends on whether or not the financial incentive is there for the person who owns it. Well, I, I was thinking, looking more at the recycle because I, they tear them down. You have a lot of metal, you have the frames and that type of thing. You know, it, it's uh, they could possibly be recycled and I, probably a lot of it just goes to dumps. I'm sure that there's an opportunity there. Do they it's have anything in Delaware like that? Uh, Any we've kind of one project in Delaware. We're not licensed to operate in Delaware. Like right. we're so we're a licensed contractor in Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Uh, we're not licensed in Delaware yet. Now we don't technically need to be because we're providing essentially consulting, and there's a de licensed demolition contractor on site. But we haven't pursued uh, anything in Delaware. We haven't spent as much time in Delaware. We've been very focused on. Philly, and then every now and then we get a call for a project like <coughs> Cape May or, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere else that's a little bit uh, farther away. But we've, we've had interest from everywhere from, you know, uh, Florida to upstate New York. We've looked at projects, and I'm sure over time we'll, we're going to travel more and more like that. We just haven't done anything in Delaware yet. Okay. Someday. Maybe we'll meet that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my contact information is on the screen, uh, but uh, Stephanie has my contact information as well. So if you uh, need to reach me, I, like I said, I'm very available. All right. And uh, you see the lovely lady behind our local reporter. She'd be happy to show you around the town. <laughs> Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. <clears throat> Nine, the uh, Management and Financial Audit Proposal Award. Okay. Um, yeah, we've last month we reported that we received uh, three uh, proposals. We decided um, to bring uh, two of those firms um, in for interviews. Um, the uh, decision and the interviews were conducted by the uh, Financial Sustainability Oversight Committee, um, <clears throat> the members that were present, as well as the Chief of police um, <clears throat> what we found were you know both firms that we interviewed were very highly qualified um, they, they've all worked in um, similar similar communities to to ours um, but the oversight committee recommends uh, e-consult um, 
with a low bid of 64,925. Um, we liked their, their, their proposal. We liked their approach to the project. They, would, they also had a more condensed timeline than, than the other firm. They'd be ready to start in October and finish up sometime um, around March. And um, we are going to be doing our initial budget presentation in October. Um, and they have also, if they're awarded the contract and able to start um, on October 1st, they could start to look at our, our budget proposals and go through that with us as well. So um, we would like to recommend uh, approving them on Monday night. Very good. Any, any questions from council on this? Okay, we'll listen. Okay. Ten conditional offer of employment, the uh, police eligibility list. Yes. Yeah, so the police department is uh, requesting replacement officers for those ha that have recently left Pottstown Police Department, and I would ask uh, Chief Markovich to further explain his request to council. Um, looking into the future to the very near future of the uh, manpower of the police department. We're currently down two police officers. Um, by the end of October, maybe even by the end of September, um, I anticipate being down two more, which will make it a total of four police officers. Um, with that in mind, I would respectfully request um, permission to give conditional offers, offers of, upper, of uh, employment um, to numbers one and two on our civil service test. Um, if we look further into 2019, we'll be losing four more uh, to retirement with the possibility of two more next year, um, which will be a total of six in 19. So I realize we can't keep up with hiring as fast as we lose them, but maybe if we could just keep up a little bit uh, with hiring two at this point. Right. Nick, did you want to touch on the, the, the training gap? Because I'm not sure everyone's aware. You know, if, if, you, if you have an officer that isn't experienced, how long it would actually take them to get up and running here in the borough? Yeah. We have to take into account whether or not they have police academy or whether they don't have the police academy. The police academy is six months long. Um, once they finish the police academy, they go through four months of training with the police department. So essentially, it's 10 months before they actually hit the street. Um, if they have the police academy, which one of the first two does, um, they'll go through our four-month training program and then be on their own. Um, so essentially it could take up to a year almost before police officers. So I understand we have one candidate that could be working in four months. Correct. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. We'll list that for Monday. 11, uh, resolution 2019 MMO for the police pension plan. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of hit 11 and 12 here. Um, we have two resolutions up for consideration regarding our, our MMO, or minimum municipal obligation as they relate to our police and non-uniform pension plans for 2019. In order to ensure that our pension benefits are, are realized, the actuary uh, who reviews these, these documents recommends that the borough provide funds to avoid future shortfalls. The MMO for the police pension has increased approximately from 1 million this year to 1.5 million in 2019. The MMO for the non-uniform pension plan has increased from approximately 300,000 this year to 920,000 in 2019. The combined MMO for 2019 is approximately 2.4 million. Um, Last year, we did receive uh, state aid to offset some of that in the amount of about $700,000 of, of these costs. Um, so, you know, we will know, we should know by October the amount of state aid the borough will receive to help offset our MMO in 2019. Um, but we really don't expect it to be that much different from what we received last year. The primary reason. Um, cited by, by um, the actuary for the rising costs is mainly due to people living longer. Um, there's an increase in, in life expectancy that has to be factored into these plans. And um, the other reason for the cost increase is, is due to investments that, that fell short of projected returns, coupled with management fees that exceeded industry norms. Um, realizing this, the Pension Board has been proactive to issue RFPs and has selected a new financial management consultant or new financial management advisor 
which has resulted in a reduction of management fees by about one half. It's expected that advancements in the technology and the medical fields continue to increase life expectancy going forward and further modifications to the post-retirement benefits may need to be examined to ensure the future financial sustainability of the borough. Okay. So if I understand you correctly, uh, the change in our payments for next year's budget is about 1.1 million. Yeah, yeah, 1.1 million. Okay. Is that counting or not counting the money that we anticipate to get from the state? That counts the money that we get from the state. So, Joe, you know, that's a significant increase in the cost of the budget for 2019. All right, we'll list this for Monday evening. Thirteen's a resolution. Montgomery County local share the stormwater arch rehabilitation. All right. So we're seeking a resolution to apply um, to a uh, CFA local share account uh, grant funding opportunity in the amount of five hundred thousand dollars to address emergency and priority repairs to underground stormwater arches. The, the scope of the grant would portion twenty percent of the funds for engineering services, forty percent for emergency repairs to collapse sections and 40% for priority repairs to prevent future collapses. The match for the grant is $100,000. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that a companion grant application will be submitted in January that if successful would cover the match requirement for this grant. So um, we're seeking approval for that on Monday night as well. Very good. Okay, we'll list that for Monday. 14, the bid award, uh, East Apron uh, for our local airport. Um, so <clears throat> we have um, 15, since August 15th, we have uh, 120 days from the um, bid opening uh, to uh, award this, this contract. And um, I'd like to suggest that we put this decision on hold so that we can have some additional time to, to vet the bids that, that came in. And we'll look to revisit this uh, next month. Okay. Uh, any comment on this? Any what was the uh, time? What was, what was the so we have 120 days 120 from August days. 15th okay. to make a decision on, on this one. And, wh and what day did the time start? August 15th. August 15th, okay. Thanks. And if you read through the bids, they're exceedingly high. Okay. Okay, so we'll just leave that alone for now. Yeah, and... Um, the, these these grants or th these projects are 95 percent grant funded, so the borough pays a, a, a five percent match. Okay, 15. Looking at a bid award for lawn maintenance and property maintenance. Um, have it? I don't have that. Yeah. Okay, um, for the, um, the first group is for the lawn and right-of-way maintenance. Um, the only bidder was Green Advantage uh, Landscaping um, at a price of uh, 27775 Okay, and then the uh, group three, wait a minute, I'm sorry. That was group one for the airport. Okay, group two is the wastewater treatment plant. And um, we had uh, Green Advantage Landscaping and um, coming in with a bid of 28,700 and MTM Mechanical DBA, Morgan Lawn Maintenance coming in at 25,120. And, um, and then group three uh, is the water division and lots. Uh, we had Green Advantage at 23,125 and MTM at um, 23,125. So, for, so those highlighted in yellow are the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So those, those that are in yellow are recommended um, for group one, green advantage is, is recommended. For group two, MTM is recommended. Um, group three, green advantage is recommended. And for the property maintenance bids, um, green advantage is recommended. There are no other bidders. Okay. And I have your assurance, Mr. Yerger. Please. You agreed to all these recommendations. Mr. Yerger gave me this sheet, so I, I think he would approve of it. One thing's different with this bidding, we have the option next spring to award, um, that, you know, as we get to try out the contractor, make sure he's doing a good job, and if he's doing a good job, in most cases, all the numbers were a carryover for 2020, so we know a fixed amount of money for going into the 2020 budget, so it could be a good thing. As long as we feel good with the, con with the contractor, we would hope that we'll be able to do that. Good. Bid it again, and we're ready to go for the next season. So we'll list this for Monday evening. 16 Tri County Active Adult Center. We'd like to hold a Cheese Toberfest beer garden on October 13th. that for Monday. Uh, 17 Pottstown Cross Country uh, request to close College Drive on November 22nd. No problems, we'll list that for Monday. 18 Parks and Recreation, the Funky Santa 5K, they asked to close College Drive and waive the $100 fee. Ms. Paez is not here, but I would explain to everybody, uh, council made a decision that we would not waive any fees uh, because of our financial situations. This particular situation, like one that just a month or so ago, it would actually cost us more to charge parks and rec the fee because it would be, would take manpower and paper and ink and everything else just to make the transaction in our books. So it's, uh, we're recommending that we do waive this particular fee since it's an internal transfer. And if there's no questions, we'll add this for Monday evening. What's the date of the Funky Santa? Sorry? What's the date of the Funky The date? Uh, December 9th, 2018 from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Okay, 19 is Harb. Uh, they're asking for a denial of 107 King Street. We'll list that. 20 is appointments uh, for HARB. Recommendation is Anthony Campbell. No questions, we'll list that. B is Human Relations Commission and they're requesting uh, that we approve Lisa Vanny. No issues, we'll list that. So, is at this time uh, we'd like to hear from our citizens present, if any. Any? Oh, nobody signed up. None. Okay. So, councillors' general discussions. Uh, Councillor Lebedin's. Anything? Uh, yes, I'd like to um, announce about the Pottstown Veterans Community Day, and that's going to be on September 29th, 2018, at, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Memorial Park. Um, we are honored on three of our local heroes. There's going to be a motorcycle ride event kickoff, uh, and you can uh, get on Facebook to participate. The glass tier, there's going to be a glass tier her hero ceremony honoring. James Galloway, Captain Robert W. Boyce, and Frank Struck, Strunk. Uh, the Hamilton Celtic Pipe and Drum Band will be there, the Pottstown High School AFROTC, and they're going to have a hero's welcome. And the food is going to be provided by the Spring City American Legion. And um, <clears throat> I think it'll be a, a really nice time, and they have a really, really wonderful venue. 
Uh, there's going to be a motorcycle ride event kickoff that starts at 930 and from the American Legion Post in Birdsboro. So if anyone is interested, uh, uh, I believe this, it's on Facebook and um, it's going to be on our community uh, TV. Great. Councilor Prosco. Councilor Lindsay. No. Councilor no. Kirkland. No. Mayor. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll also be brief, and I have nothing more to add. Uh, there's no executive session tonight, so meeting adjourned. <laughs>